when you're talking about the comparison for four bedroom, two bathroom versus a three bedroom, three bathroom or a four bedroom, three bathroom, typically it's about that extra bathroom or the design and the layout where you're trying to create on suites within the bathroom. You know, that flexibility basically means that, you know, you're changing the position from a negative $20,000 property to maybe a negative $6,000 property, but it's still negative. You're listening to Help Me Buy Property Podcast, powered by Investor Partner Group. We help improve lifestyles by building scalable and sustainable generational wealth and passive income streams. We do this via our ecosystem that is a one-stop shop to all property investment needs. From evidence-based, data-driven buyers agency, industry-renowned portfolio reviews and property strategies, property development with and for clients, tax, SMSF, business structures advisory and cash flow real estate. Everything we do is to help people achieve financial independence and not just basic financial freedom by using property as a tool and as a medium. Presently, we've launched Australian Property Academy where we are training and teaching buyers agents, property advisors, property strategic partners and secrets to finding investor grade properties to student investors. Connect now to experience it yourself or drop in a line below at info at helpmebuy.com.au to get more information. Be kind and happy investing. Today we are going to basically do a postmortem of a rooming house and um, it would be a fun and interesting conversation because we are going to talk about the pros and the cons of rooming houses. Now we've talked a lot about rooming houses and cash flow strategies on our Help Me Buy Property podcast. But today we are going to dive a lot more deeper. Everyone talks about high earnings and multiple tenants and so varied risk, etc. But, you know, no one talks about the valuations, the builders going bust and too good to be on the paper and the tenants fighting and killing each other and the council problems and the fulfillment and the vacancy rates. And so we are going to go right at the deep end talking about rooming houses and the problems with the rooming houses and you know the conversions whether they work or they don't work now before i kick off let me introduce my co-host today mr rajan drum roll hi raj how are you today hey good thanks how i are you? am awesome brother thank you for coming out today discussing rooming houses or co-living properties or or properties with multiple occupants or houses with multiple occupants so many different names of the same beast. So from a user's and listener's perspective, you know, let's give them a bit of an understanding of what is a co-living property? What is a rooming house? What is a house of multiple occupants? All right. So thanks a lot, Moss, first of all, for inviting me to your podcast. It's, it's always been a pleasure. I remember we met, I think, a couple of years back, which has gone quite well in regards to my own property journey. And uh, my journey with co-living started basically from uh, the adversity, which pretty much everyone is facing all over Australia, considering the interest rate increases and how to kind of generate more cash flow and prevent the leakage or, as I say, blood bath in the property portfolio. So basically, a co-living property is a property wherein we have independent bedrooms and uh, co-living, as the name suggests, uh, there are multiple people sharing the same house. And um, I deliberately don't want to generalize it by saying that every single room has an independent ensuite, majorly because my experience with a lot of players outside cash flow real estate or IPG, there are ecosystems wherein they have a shared bathroom as well. So essentially, from a conceptual level, it's an ecosystem or a house, to simplify it, wherein there are multiple people living and sharing facilities. There are people who build a better ecosystem. There are people who build an average ecosystem and there are worse ecosystems as well available, which generally defines how much cash flow you can generate and more so from an ethical point of view, what sort of living conditions you are actually providing them so to live in. We are going to go into the deep end, you know, talking about all of these things, but You know, for the viewers and listeners, let's help them understand first, what is the comparison, right? You know, talking about, you know, four bedroom, two bathroom, normal house versus a six bedroom, six bathroom or a nine bedroom, nine bathroom or or whatever that means. You know, how much more earning potential are we talking about? The higher earnings that everyone talks about when you talk about cool living. All right. So let's start from the lower end of, 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 of the ecosystem. And by lower end, I essentially mean that if you're an investor, you're looking for 
your very next investment. You don't know about co-living. Essentially, in Australia, what you look at is a house and land, which is a four bed or two bathroom, essentially, or uh, an existing house, which is a GAN on an average, the most popular four bedroom, two bathroom house. If I compare it with our lowest ended product, which is a four by three, the comparison is almost double the amount of rent. And the calculations are very simplistic, right? So on an average, you get like around $300 per week for an individual tenant. For a standard four bedroom, two bathroom house, either existing or a brand new one, you're looking at anywhere around 450 to 500 in a good suburb. So when we multiply three by three, then when I say four by three, it means three people are sharing that, uh, uh, that accommodation. You're looking at 900 versus 450. Now, moving on from there, when we when we get into the true meaning of cash flow and 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 true meaning of co-living, which can actually really generate a very very high cash flow, we are looking at a gross of around ninety three thousand for a six by six. So that's six bedroom, uh, approximately six bathroom. Six bedroom, six yep. bathroom. So each and every bedroom will have an ensuite, ensuite, private ensuite, and and, and own private space essentially. And I'll get into details on the nitty gritties on how we make it even better. But to answer to your question, if you go move on to nine by nine, we are looking at a one forty k gross, one hundred forty thousand, uh, which can generate. Yeah, we are talking about one forty k gross annually, which a nine bedroom, nine bathroom can generate for you. Um, the net uh, is approximately around fifty thousand dollars after all the outgoings, including your mortgage. Wow. Okay. So if you talk about your gross yield terminologies, we are sitting way above ten percent. And like I mean, you know, that is the rosy side, you know. And I see a majority of people talking about the rosy side, right? When you compare, you know, four hundred and fifty dollars per week for a four bedroom, two bathroom versus a nine hundred dollars per week for a three bedroom, three bathroom, uh, you're missing an important detail here, right? And that important detail is that the owner is basically paying the bills, right? And so. You know, does the the test of the times stands true when you look at four bedroom, two bathroom versus three bedroom, three bathroom? When you are taking off all the bills, you're you're paying electricity, you're paying gas, you're paying telephone, you're paying water, you're paying cleaning, you're paying gardening. It's a lot of expenses, and so when you bring all of that together, when you compare like for like, you know, does this still make sense? Especially at the lower price. I would say a tiny bit. That's why. Um... Uh, the two flagship products we have are nine bedrooms and nine bathrooms and six bedrooms, six bathrooms. We essentially don't project a four bedroom, three bathroom as a true meaning of cash flow. And you're absolutely right, Moss, that on an average, you're still a tiny bit better. I would still like to call it out than a normal four bedroom, two bathroom, even after paying your utility bills. But if you are thinking that by a four bedroom, three bathroom, you'll be able to generate a lot more higher cash flow. I'm afraid so that's not the fact. Is it fair to so say means, that when you're talking about the comparison for four bedroom, two bathroom versus a three bedroom, three bathroom or a four bedroom, three bathroom, typically it's about that extra bathroom or the design and the layout where you're trying to create en suites within the bathroom. You know, that flexibility basically means that, you know, you're changing the position from a negative $20,000 property to maybe a negative $6,000 property, but it's still negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've you've really nailed it, right? So yes, uh, I would say a big yes. But there are two more two uh, advantages which which come with 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 creating that ecosystem. So let's forget about six by six and nine by nine or a five by five or super high cash flows because what we are talking about here is if you compare apples with apples and we are actually comparing a four bedroom, two bathroom, and you have the budget only or the serviceability only to invest in that then 100% definitely a four bedroom, three bathroom will be a better investment. Um, I will say a couple of reasons here. One, definitely you are getting, uh, like Moss mentioned, a tiny bit less negative cash flow. But then the other reason is that they are more attractive to the owner occupiers because now the ecosystem, and again, I'll talk about our designs. What we are building is that every single bedroom in that four, bath, four bedroom, three bathroom ecosystem uh, can access a private ensuite. One is shared between the two, but it's a better design, I would say, as compared to a normal four bedroom, two bathroom house, which generates more, it's more attractive for the owner occupiers as and, well. And we'll talk about the it. six bedroom and the nine bedrooms as well, because, you know, that's where a lot of, you know, uh, you know, big players are playing. Um, but let's grill down, you know, four bedroom, three bathroom a bit more. And so, you know, again, you know, a rosy story where you're talking about, you know, all the rooms, you know, fully you know, occupied, et cetera. 
think about the risk that you're creating as well, right? Now here I'm playing the devil's advocate that, and you know, mind you for views and listeners, I have two of these in my property portfolio as well. So me playing a devil's advocate is a big thing here, but you know, let's play that out because the risk between, you know, you having a four bedroom, two bathroom where, you know, you have a single tenant, you know, that is a long-term tenant that might stay there for five years, 10 years versus a four bedroom, three bathroom where you have three tenants and they might, you know, may or may not be occupying all the places. They might, you know, fight and kill each other. Uh, they might create a lot of repairs and maintenance. They might leave a lot of the house in a really dirty condition. And so people are quite emotionally attached in that price bracket, right? Especially if I own a house and, you know, if I've lived in that house and I'm going to move out to upgrade and I'm, you know, keeping that house as a tenancy, I want the, that memories to basically stay in that house. And so six tenants or three tenants or four tenants coming in and, you know, trashing that house is something that is hard to stomach, right? Don't get yourself taken on a ride by property spookers, so-called property investment advisors, or buyers agents who are selling house and land packages, or off the plan properties or apartments. Get yourself a copy of this book called The Millennial's Guide to Property Investing. This book is not just for millennials. The title suggests, but it's actually the most advanced way of investing in property. Now, this book will relate to your clients, your colleagues, and other business owners. There are so many property spookers out there who have come out of the woodwork over the last three or five years. And there is so much misinformation out there that I had to write a book about all the F-ups that people can actually avoid in order to be super successful in the property investment journey. Some of these are really easy to identify, but they are so costly to fix once these mistakes are made. So it's a short book. It's easy to read. It has a lot of stories. It has a lot of examples. And it is a true guide for people who want to do it themselves. My name is Moxin Reza. This is my story and a lot of you will relate to parts of this story if you're not born in the riches and if you're trying to build a property portfolio that can last generations and help you improve your lifestyle along the way. So I give you a chance to come out there and have a read. Be kind, stay safe, keep smiling, keep investing and please do check out the book. Yep, yep, yeah, I, I I agree, but um, I think because this were, you're you're playing the devil's advocate, so I'll just squish that argument by saying you always have a choice. So we're talking about you planning to invest in a four bedroom, two bathroom house, and then you direct your thoughts, you talk to us, and you build a four bedroom, three bathroom house, for example. If you do that, you will definitely get a notch higher rent, even with the family you are actually planning to rent it out to to start with. That's one. <laughs> Secondly. If you talk about uh, tenants killing each other, maintenance and you know what not, it's applicable to all the rooming houses. And it's one of the biggest myths, I would say, because what we need to understand and uh, dive a tiny bit, not a lot, but uh, the magic number is three, right? So in Victoria and most of the states, you have that magical number three, wherein if you go above that, then you you know trigger the planning permits and you need to get council approvals and whatnot. So if you're talking about that number three, you can still provide individual independent tenancy agreements to everyone. So the peace of mind you get by tenanting your house in a traditional way with that piece of paper, which is called the tenancy agreement and their bonds by which they are, you know, you're safeguarded essentially as a landlord. It's exactly same with the rooming houses as well. That's number one. Number two, Again, it depends upon the property management agency you're going with. But then the control you have in accepting the applications is exactly the same as well. So you have the control all the time. And uh, you've actually hit the cord because this is one of the most popular objections or questions we always get asked. And if you do the right way, if you are abiding by the legalities, if you are, and again, I'm I know I'm jumping the gun, but then if you are actually going the correct way and getting the rooming house registrations, then you have the power. And the icing and a little cherry on the cake is that not even just that, there are housing rules, documents as well, which the tenants have to sign. So in that regard, you are okay that you know no one will be thrashing your house. And I'll close it with one of the <laughs> biggest kind of experiences we had that if you're in love with the house and you mentioned that you know you have memories if you give it to a traditional you know uh, to a normal family 
uh, where cooking is happening all the time versus three independent working professionals. Uh, when you go after three to five years, you'll find your kitchen untouched. Sure, sure, sure. So it's more maintained, yes. I would yes. say. And look, I mean, yeah. I'm from a viewers and listeners perspective, what I'm doing is I'm taking them on a journey, right? So I'm starting them from ground up, you know, four bedroom, three bathroom versus four bedroom, two bathroom so that they can see the like for like comparison, right? A lot of people and industry out there basically compares a four bedroom, two bathroom to a six bedroom, six bathroom or a nine bedroom, nine bathroom. And I always say to them, this is you comparing apples to iPhones, not when, you know, oranges, right? You know, it's, it's a completely wrong comparison, right? So I'm trying to basically scale this up slowly and gradually so that people can understand this a bit more. So I understand, you know, the logic behind this. It makes sense that for a tiny bit more benefit, you are taking, you know, significant amount of risk. You know, that's how I see when you talk about four bedroom, two bathroom versus four bedroom, three bathroom. And so, you know, people might not be comfortable with the risk return ratio, especially in that lower threshold or the lower price point, you know, let's take a next step. So what is the next step along the way? So I hear a lot of people basically going down the path of conversions. And that's a big thing out there. You know, I see some big names and some big players in Melbourne, in Queensland, you know, operating in this space as well, where you have a four bedroom, two bathroom, and you have two livings or three livings. And, you know, all of a sudden you have now a six bedroom, two bathroom, or a six bedroom, three bathroom, or an eight bedroom, you know, two bathroom. And that's very enticing and exciting as well, right? So you have a converted house, you know, you're getting people to share houses or share bathrooms and you have six or seven rooms that you know not you that you're renting and you are converting a house that you that you know you've bought and so i see a lot of these packages coming out flooding my inbox all the time where you know you have a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house which is a six bedroom two bathroom conversion and you can convert it into a high cash flow gross you know rent um of almost about eighty thousand dollars to take us through like you know what's the science what's the rocket science behind that yeah, I'll start with there's no rocket science behind it. You can do it yourself as well. How much uh, but cost? the reason How much would a, a conversion cost on average? Yeah, that's, that's what is coming on to that. Uh, we have a lot of clients, by the way, coming our way, uh, looking at the net cash on cash return, uh, which we create for a house, which is custom built, designed for rooming houses, which can generate, and th these are facts, which can generate at least 70 to $80 per room more than any converted house wherein they are shared Let's bathrooms. take a step back, right? Now, so if you talk purely yeah. from a conversion perspective and we are saying, okay, X is the amount that we are spending on conversion, what does that amount look like? And how does that change, you know, from an overall, you know, profitability perspective? Yeah, so I was about to come there that why the clients are actually moving on because they've learned the hard way. And it's great you have actually brought this conversation so that uh, your viewers and listeners don't have to learn the hard way. So if you do the math, I'm, uh, I'll just take a simple example of, let's say, uh, uh, 600K you know, or a 700K house. When you are going for a conversion, you need to understand that you need to part away with a deposit and a stamp duty for an existing house, which goes anywhere between 120 to 150K. That amount you have already parted away. Now, bear in mind that the job is not done yet. Because whatever that house was, was not a rooming house. And that's why, you know, you'll be then converting it. Which means you're actually looking at anywhere between 150 to 200K to convert that house. And if you say, okay, let's talk about, okay, don't over exaggerate it, but that's a reality. But let's say anywhere between 100 to 200K. Suddenly you realize that you have ended up parting away with anywhere between 200K to 250K cash already. And at the end of the day, the asset you get is an old house. And you can absolutely not create an independent ensuite for every single room. And why I'm emphasizing on that fact is, and you can check, every one of you, you can check for yourself. Go to flatmatesrealestate.com.au and look at those listings. You will find a room with a shared bathroom ecosystem at 220 versus a room with an ensuite at 300 plus. So at the end of the day, the biggest... Um, Learning, which I mentioned about learning the hard way, is that you are suddenly cash crunch. You are parted away with a 250k odd amount, and still you are left with an asset which is not generating that amount of cash sure, flow. Sure, sure. And I'll talk about versus later yeah. on when we when we talk about our product. But so yeah, my, that's, that's my classic thinking here. in relation to conversion typically is, and again, this is me playing devil's advocate, is that with an old house, you know, where you are doing a conversion. 
you have six tenants or eight tenants using two bathrooms, right? And so these are real people using two bathrooms. So, you know, I'm comfortable, yeah, a family of three or four using two bathrooms, but now you have eight or six or seven adults properly using toilets and bathrooms. And so, you know, they're taking shower once a day or at least twice a day or, you know, whatever their, you know, shower, you know, hygiene regime looks like. But the usage of some of these things, you know, quite extensively means that, you know, my repairs and maintenance goes significantly higher because again, you know, I'm looking at converting these in some of these old areas or old houses, right? So, and then, you know, the second thing that I've always noticed and realized with these conversions typically is that they're really Frankenstein sort of conversions where, you know, they have a pod-like bathroom that they'll stick it into a in, into a bedroom and call it an ensuite, but it's not really an ensuite. It's like one of those studio type bathrooms or, you know, if you've gone to a construction site and you've seen those, you know, toilet tub sitting outside and, you know, they look very similar to that minus, you know, the doors are actually glass or plastic. So um, there is a lot of Frankenstein sort of approach when you look at conversion. And so it's quite interesting that you say that, you know, these conversions can cost you know, up to hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is almost as similar to you know adding a granny at the back, because a, a cheap granny at the back would cost up to one fifty thousand dollars as well. And so, what does that mean? You know, do you have this? The process means that you still have to go through the council. Do you still have to go through all of these building surveyors for two conversions? You know, when you're going through conversions, etc. So there is that intense process still available, or not really? Like you don't have to worry about it. I would say you should, but I don't think so. People do that. That's where, you know, I will not say that, but let me, let me use that word. That's where that illegality comes into the picture, wherein um, it's just going on like an accepted uh, modus operandi in different states. Being in and being the director of cash real estate, I was approached by someone uh, for my property in, in Woodville South that, you know, uh, that's okay. We'll just add this, this and that and they'll be. And I was just asking about the council approvals and whatnot. And they were like, don't worry about it. Who cares? Who is even going to the council to actually talk about it? And that's where the risk is, Moss. And thanks for bringing that up because a lot of people don't realize, and I'm calling it out loud to everyone who is getting into co-living conversions or whatever, please ask these questions that whether my house will be registered as a rooming house with the council or not, right? Uh, because essentially, and again, I'm repeating myself, but you need to have your house registered as a rooming house to provide independent tenancy agreements to every single tenant. Now, you you might meet someone who might say, oh, it doesn't matter, we can you know still get it rented out, but that's not the legal way. Council can turn back any time and then squish it. So that's obviously the worry part which is happening in the community, which and it's, I think not it's quite make interesting. Aware I, think, of, I think a lot of these conversions, you know, as I said, you know, because they are Frankenstein sort of conversions, and we are taking a step-by-step -step approach, I would be more inclined towards buying a duplex because I know that, you know, I don't have to pay electricity bills, gas bills, cleaning bills, you know, um, you know, that sort of heavy repairs and maintenance that comes with a lot of this versus a conversion, right? Because, you know, when I look at the numbers on a net basis, I see duplex is basically standing at a very similar number to a uh, co-living property that is converted you know on the gross everything looks you know amazing right you see these emails coming through as i said you know you see all of these facebook ads coming through eighty-eight thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars or sometimes even ninety thousand dollars for conversions but you know when you look at the net when you look at the risk when you look at the repairs and maintenance bill when you look at the property management like it's it, you know sometimes these property managements look quite expensive as well it almost feels that, okay, I would always be inclined towards a duplex versus, you know, co-living because they are naturally, they're easier to sell as well, right? A converted house, which is Frankenstein, six bedroom, three bathroom, you know, would be almost impossible to sell. Yeah, exactly right. I think uh, the, the problem statement is in the calculations and the way the marketing happens for these houses. I'll start off with heavily projected rentals per room, which are nowhere close to what they actually get. And again, it's, a, it's the same scenario of not having an ensuite. Then the other bit is that definitely 100% the maintenance would be way, 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 way higher because you'll always try not to overcapitalize when you're acquiring an existing house. And then, you know, you're getting someone to convert it. Uh, you can only do so much when you're converting an old house. So when you calculate, I would say definitely a duplex would make way more sense if you really calculate all your outgoings and also remember the initial cash you actually parted away yes. with, 
you will definitely see that the duplex will be a much more uh, much better investment if you are going for a yes. conversion and so you know the natural segue is you know because you are climbing this hierarchy of you know co-living properties because it starts from four bedroom two bathroom four bedroom three bathroom you've talked about three bedroom three bathroom you've talked about conversions and next in the cab or next in the rank is basically the five bedroom five bathrooms and the six bedroom six bathrooms and and those are typically the products that you know I see a lot of people selling in Perth. Um, I yep. see a lot of people selling in Melbourne, regional Victoria, Metro yep. Victoria. I see people doing, um, you know, pitching out these, you know, duplex deals where you know in Brisbane, you know, you could do five on each side and split and create on manufactured equity, and these would cost you somewhere around yep. one point five, one point six million dollars. That's all for today, folks. We have covered a lot of ground on co-living spaces, aka the roomy houses. But we are not done yet as we have only scratched the surface. Tune in next time for part two, where we will dive a lot more deeper into the world of co-living or rooming houses or housing with multiple occupants. Explore the benefits and the challenges of, you know, the six bedroom, the nine bedroom houses with nine bathrooms and nine en suites. Thank you for listening to us today. This is your host, Moxen, checking out. Keep smiling, keep investing. Take care. Be kind. This is Moss checking out. Adios.